a dye. Um, they'll give the patient a dye that um, specifically, it, it's basically like dyed sugar, if you can think of it that way, it's dyed glucose. And they know that the cancer cells really like glucose more than our normal cells. And so basically that tumor absorbs all the dye. So because we know certain things that are hallmarks of cancer, we can also in a way like hijack those things to help us understand it more and, and be able to treat it more. Um, the other thing that cancer does is it invades other tissues and um, many cancers have the ability to spread to um, other parts of the body, which is called metastasis. Um, and then the last thing, and I, the reason why I got to this last is because this is the next part of the talk. Um, cancer really messes up the um, genetics. So cancer is actually, for the most part, a genetic disease. It's a genetic con um, um, condition. And um, it's the result of getting all these mutations and what it causes is, is this thing called genome instability. And we'll, I'll show you some examples and we'll see like what that really looks like when you're kind of digging into the cancer genetics part. Um, so brief overview of cancer biology and we're gonna talk a little bit of, um, a little bit more about some other things. So you might've heard some different terms when um, people talk about cancer. So perhaps um, you've heard the word um, neoplasm and that really is just a, uncontrolled proliferation of cells that results in some sort of overgrowth. And so it doesn't necessarily mean that like a, a neoplasm is not necessarily a um, cancer because you could have different types of growth that are neoplasms. So like moles, certain types of moles, or um, there's these things called polyps. Um, so you can have different types of growths. Um, so benign neoplasms are single limited mass of cells. So those are the things that aren't going to invade, that aren't going to um, cause metastasis that we're not too worried about. Malignant um, neoplasms, those are the ones that we would traditionally think of as cancer and they have the ability to invade the um, other tissues and um, some of them have the ability to spread to other parts of the body. And when they spread to other parts of the body, like I said, that is metastasis or metastases is the plural. Um, so this is just a diagram showing how you can start with one cell here over on the left and it has um, some mutation or collection of mutations and it starts to grow and it still is contained. And once it grows to a certain point where it comes dysplastic, meaning that it becomes a irregular um, shape or form or um, creating kind of like a disruption to the structure of the tissue it's in, um, then we might say that that has malignant potential. And then when you get to a point where you have enough genetic diversity and enough invasion, we have what's called in situ cancer. So that means it's a, in situ means it's like it's in site, it stays in its location. And then after that, you get invasive cancer, which means that it's starting to um, create roots and in, in, um, spread to multiple layers of that um, tissue system and cause problems. So cancers are classified by the tissues of origin. And again, this is more cancer terminology. So you might've heard the word carcinoma. And what does that mean? Carcinoma is the most common um, type of cancer. About 80% of all cancers are what we call carcinomas, which they are derived from what's called epithelial tissue. And epithelial tissue is basically any tissue that um, lines um, something or covers a surface. So, the most well-known epithelial tissue is our skin. So here on the left, we have a diagram of the skin and it's composed of a variety of epithelial tissues. And so depending on which um, type of epithelial tissue has that cancer, you'll get different types of skin cancers. So you could have squamous cell carcinoma, which is the squamous cell or basal cell carcinoma or melanoma. Um, 
this figure on the right shows a bunch of different other types of carcinomas based off of um, the, end of the specific type of epithelial tissue. But the important thing to note is that lung cancers are carcinomas, kidney cancers are carcinomas, intestinal and gastrointestinal um, are carcinomas, reproductive tissues are carcinomas. Um, the next type of cancer you might have heard of are called sarcomas. Um, and these are less common, but um, they are, they originate from connective tissue and connective tissue includes muscle, it includes muscle, bones, tendons, and um, blood vessels, not the blood itself, but the actual vascular tissue. So um, maybe one you've heard of is like um, osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer. Um, yeah. And then the last main type of cancers are, le are leukemias and lymphomas, and they are derived from blood cells. And a lot of, and, um, a lot of times these are called liquid cancers and it's because they're, you know, if you think of blood, it looks like a liquid, although it's not, as we know, it's full of cells. Um, and most of these are called by their acronyms. So AML, CML, ALL. -L. And this diagram just shows kind of where those different types of cancer sit. So the lymphoid stem cells create lymphocytes and those are the um, cells that result in ALL or CLL. Um, in the myeloid um, progenitor cells, they create granulocytes and those um, or where you would get AML or CML. And whether or not they're um, A or C just means um, chronic or acute. And a lot of it has to do with age and some other factors. Okay, so that's a little bit about the cancer um, biology background. Now we're gonna get into some mutations and mutagenesis. So I believe throughout this week, you've learned about um, what a mutation is, and um, how we look at mutations and things like that. So I'm not gonna get in too much detail, but just a little recap that we know that a mutation is a change in the normal base pair sequence. And in cancer specifically, um, we often are looking at the um, base pair change or the DNA sequence change that will alter the proteins that it codes for or the RNAs um, if you wanna get more advanced. Um, so I'm sure you already learned about point mutations which are simple single base paired mutations. What I'm not sure is if you learned about all the different types of chromosomal mutations. And the reason why this is important is that because in cancer, chromosomal mutations or chromosomal abnormalities, they make up the bulk of mutations that we see in solid tumors. And when I say solid tumors, I mean everything except for those blood cancers. So um, I'm not gonna go through every single definition. Um, I'll share these slides with you guys after the, the boot camp. So if you wanna um, dive deeper, you um, more than welcome to, but there's different types. There's duplications, inversions, deletions, insertions, and translocations. And the definitions are, are, are pretty straightforward. Um, sometimes if you, if you kind of want to have a better um, conceptual understanding of how chromosomal mutations work, there are some really cool um, activities you can do with like Legos. Um, and if I can find one of those activities, I can share it later on in the Slack because um, it's something you can do at home to kind of get your brain to wrap around like what it looks like um, to have a duplication, inversion, deletion, and insertion and, and such. Okay, so chromosomal abnormalities. Now, what does that look like in an actual tumor or in a cancer? So this um, figure right here is an example of what we call a tumor karyotype. And in the tumor karyotype, this has been done by um, fish, which are fluorescent probes that are different colors that are um, specifically attached to different chromosomes. So 
different chromosomes will have different colors. So what you can do is you can see where those chunks of chromosomes are becoming missing and where they're jumping around to different parts of other chromosomes and different um, parts of the genome and also where these chromosomes being duplicated and where they're being inserted. So um, if anyone wants to take a stab, does anyone see anything that's, that is unexpected or different than what you might expect given what you know about um, normal cells? Anyone can unmute themselves or they can, they can um, write something in the chat if they would like to share an observation. Oops. Okay, so, cause everyone's quiet, I'll, I'll point out some things. So uh, one of the- There is, oh. uh, V has a comment. She says there are some with three chromosomes and Leandra has the comment also, not all the chromosomes are in pair. Yes, yes, very good observations. Yes, some have more than two chromosomes. Um, so you can see chromosome seven, there's one, two, three. Um, there, chromosome three, there's one, two, three. Leandra also said, yeah, they're not all in pairs. Yes, that's correct. Um, another observation too is that remember I said that the chromosomes will will be kind of color coded so they'll have the same color so we see that in one they're both yellow when we get to three this the two are kind of like this pink color but then the one on the most right also has red so it has a piece of another chromosome attached to it um so basically what happens in cancer is all of these pieces of the chromosome, they get kind of jumbled up and mixed around the genome. And yes, Leandra, yes, it looks like the third chromosome was split in half and put on top of the third. Yeah, so part of chromosome two um, might have jumped over and was inserted to chromosome three, exactly. So. We're, um, we look at these things in cancer genetics because this tells us how we got here, how we got to the cancer and um, what um, we might be able to understand to better treat it. So, and in order to get these mutations, you have to have mutagenesis. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of details on mutagenesis because that's not my expertise. <laughs> However, this one slide kind of um, summarizes some key points. And so basically when you have different mutations or what we call, we can also say DNA lesions because um, the, the, before you can actually get the base pair to change, you have to have some event. And so that first event is like a lesion. You get some damage to cause the lesion. So some common damages our damaging agents are x-rays, some drugs, um, UV, um, oxygen radicals, like there's different sorts of molecules and chemicals that cause these DNA lesions. And the DNA lesions lead to a very specific change in the DNA. So we can see things like a double strand break. We can see things that are called crosslinks. So it's when the, the um, two strands get linked together. So, you know, there's two strands of DNA. What we can also see are um, two neighboring base pairs being um, kind of glued together and we call these dimers. Um, we can also see base pairs being added, which, call, which are called insertions, or we can see base pairs being deleted, which are called deletions. And so with all of these specific types of DNA lesions, there are DNA repair pathways that are supposed to come back and kind of clean everything up and fix it. So this is why we don't just walk around with cancer every day. Um, but some of these work better than others. So this little column that says fidelity means that um, those that have more plus signs are more um, trustworthy in, in working correctly. So like nucleotide excision repair is, has a high fidelity, is a high fidelity process. 
whereas non-homologous injoining that fixes these double strand breaks and cross links, it's not that um, trustworthy. So it has a lot of errors. So when you insert, oh yeah. There are a few questions. Uh, Shay and Sanya have a question. Uh, you can unmute yourself and ask. And um, my question was that, um, could you explain again what a, a chromosome is? Oh yeah, sorry, I didn't, I didn't really, sorry, this is going through the slides. <laughs> um, yeah, so chromosome is a, um, I would say it's a continuous piece of, DNA. So in your body, you have, or in your cells, you have um, your, all of your DNA is divided into 23 pairs of chromosomes. And it's just the way that our cells have found to best organize all of the genes. So chromosome one on, in my cells is going to look nearly identical to chromosome one in any other person. And because the genes are going to be in a specific order. So because cancer, as you saw in that karyotype, those chromosomes were um, mixed matched, you know, pieces were put in different places and they had multiple um, copies. It means that now you have more genes than you're supposed to have, or you have less genes than you're supposed to have. And they're in a different order. And the order matters because, um, how those genes are turned on and turned off for different um, functions of the cells and the tissues in the body are based off of that order. So cancer messes up the order of these genes. And so then it can change how those genes actually are turned on and turned off. And then it can change um, how your cells work. And it goes back to that first, um, that first slide that I talked about, those hallmarks of cancer. So being invasive and um, growing uncontrollably. So um, I hope that answers that question. And then um, Daniel, Thank you asked you. Yeah, yeah go ahead. Daniel asked this, um, could the sun cause cancer? Actually, I'm gonna talk about that after tobacco. So just wait, mm -hmm. <laughs> we'll mm -hmm. get there. Um, and Jenny also has a question. Oh, yes, go ahead. I don't remember the scientific term, but when the slide right before you were talking about how these two strands, if they connect and like our bodies like completely like fix themselves. So depending on the fidelity rate, like they'll might be low or high to fix themselves. So if it doesn't fix themselves, is that how cancer starts from the root cause? Exactly, yes, you've got the right frame of thought, Jenny. So that if it does not, if the lesion does not get fixed, it becomes a mutation. And then that mutation sticks around when the cells divide, and then you get more mutations, and then that's the slow process into getting the cancer. Okay, thank you. I just wanted to clarify. Yeah, yeah, that was a good question. Um, yeah, these are all great questions. So thank you for, for bringing them up. All right, so we're gonna talk a little bit about tobacco. I'm sure you guys all know that tobacco causes cancer, traditionally lung cancer. So we know in the US, um, and I know not everyone here is from the US, so I know that there's different rates of smoking, but in the US it's about one in five people and about 30% of all cancer deaths can be connected back to tobacco smoke. And we know that it's the most single direct cause of cancer death in the US. And we know that it's related to a lot of different types of cancer through various research. So it's not just lung cancer, it's a whole host of other cancers that um, are related to tobacco smoke. Um, so the thing about tobacco that makes it really um, a, a good starter for cancer um, is that it contains carcinogens when um, it's actually burned. So when the tobacco is burned, the carcinogens are created and then you inhale those when you smoke. 
Um, two of the strongest carcinogens that are in tobacco are NNN and PAH. They're, they're chemicals. So don't, um, don't focus too much on like these names, just realize there's these chemicals in tobacco that um, are carcinogens. And this is a list of various ones in the um, amounts that you would see in cigarette smoke. And so some like have really high numbers, have really high values and some are a lot lower. Um, and then there's some that are weak carcinogens like acetyl aldehyde is a weak carcinogen. So how do we take tobacco smoke and then end up with cancer? So this is the process. It starts with creating mutations, so mutagenesis. So you get cigarette smoke, creates carcinogens, then you get that DNA lesion, causes DNA damage. Then traditionally it gets repaired, but sometimes the repair doesn't work and then you get mutations, which is mutagen mutagenesis. So after you've developed, um, let me just skip through some of this. So after you've also developed some other, um, carcinogens, you can get secondary carcinogens from them. And one type is called a free radical. And the free radical itself can um, interact with not just the genetic material, but also with the cellular material and increase or change the, um, the tissue like structure a little bit. And so that can also, um, make that site particularly more prone to starting the cancer if some of the mutations have already been kind of laid out. So there's multiple steps, like you have mutations and then you also have some sort of like injury, I guess you can say, to a little bit of that tissue in that area. And then you start to um, build up that tumor. And then yeah, you get the malignant transformation and then you get something really nasty, like that's an example of um, lung cancer. Um, so now skin cancer, um, that's another well-known one with um, sunlight being, everyone's telling us wear sunblock, why do we wear sunblock, whatever. Um, a couple things that I wanna bring up too. So it's often assumed that if you have melanin, so if you have a dark pigmented skin or darker pigmented skin, that you are, um, less likely to get skin cancer. This is true for some types of skin cancer. Um, it's only for melanoma. And we'll talk about later, there's like different, there's multiple different types of all different types of cancer. So um, yes, if you're black or if you're, if you're a darker person, you can get skin cancer. Um, so definitely still wear <laughs> sunblock, please everyone. <laughs> Um, so UV, UV radiation is composed of actually three things. It's there's UVC, B, and A. And the, the, um, the different types penetrate our bodies differently. So UVC rays are bigger and they actually don't get into our skin. They don't get into our body and they're, um, we don't worry about them. UVBs, they get through the top layer of skin. And these are associated with sunburns. And these are um, more associated with cancer, with, with well, specifically with melanoma, with, uh, most skin cancers. And then UVAs, they get deeper into the dermis layer. And these are mostly associated with aging. I think I might even have that summarized on the next slide. Yeah, UVA rays are linked to increased aging. So I have a photo here of an older man who he's 69 years old and he spent 28 years as a delivery truck driver. And one of the things that his doctor noticed when he went in for an exam was that he had asymmetrical wrinkling on his skin. So if you look at his photo on the left side, so this side, you see his skin's much more wrinkled than on the right side. Um, so given what we know about UVA rays, what might you think happened? And, and think about what kind of job he has. Does anyone want to um, say anything? I think, I think yeah. light came through the window of his delivery truck. 
and then affected that part of his face more than the other side. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly what happened. Yeah, that's your very good cancer detective. Or <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so being a delivery driver and being in, and remember this is in the U.S. So they're driving on the um, the left side of the road. So his left face faces the window, which the sunlight comes in. And after 28 years of that, and probably not wearing sunblock, you get quicker aging on one side of the face than on the other. So um, it's a really easy way to see what the sun does to you, um, particularly if you don't have protection. All right. Um, we can kind of skip through most of this, but the main point here is that, the main point that I wanted to bring out too is that um, the UV, UVB rays are the ones that are linked to um, creating carcinogens. And when you look at sunscreens, make sure that they are UVA and UVP, UVB um, um, protection. And no sunscreen is going to protect you against UVC rays because that's what the ozone is there for. So um, you don't have to worry about that. All right. So before I talked about there's different types of skin cancer. So this is just a figure to show you the different types. And so melanoma is the most deadly. And this is the one we normally think of when we talk about skin cancer. And this is the one that's mostly, um, that's, that's less common in darker skinned people, but you can still get squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma. So still protect your skin as much as you can. Um, and get, get, get yourself checked. I think, I mean, not, you guys are very young, so <laughs> It's not something you'll have to worry about now, but I mean, your parents, your grandparents, I've had a relative that had, um, I don't remember exactly which type of skin cancer. I think it was squamous cell, but um, they got squamous cell carcinoma and that's actually how they passed away. And it, because they're so hard to see, you know, you, you don't really think you need to have all of your moles on your body looked at. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about tumor evolution and, um, Hopefully we will get through this with a little bit of time to talk about the, um, the coding activity before the break. So um, basically kind of the key point that I want you to think about is that tumors or like a tumor itself is a representation of evolution in real time. And so when we talk about evolution, you probably think about how, um, you know, people will say like humans evolved from primates or monkeys and things like that. And like, eh, like that's, that's not the type of evolution we're talking about. And that's not really correct in that way, but um, really what evolution is, it's the change in DNA over time. It's the change in the genetic sequence over time. And that's what happens in cancer because cancer is um, a genetic condition. The genetics change over time. So with tumors, there's a couple of things that are important to know. We know that early in life, so basically when you're, you're a baby or you're born or you're a young kid, um, you're born with very few mutations in your genetic code. Um, basically your, your genetic code is gonna be nearly identical to the genetic code that was given to you um, from your mother and your father. But, through, but you could have a few different changes in, in that um, exact code that they gave you that you got through that early stage in development, right? But as you grow up, as you go through life and you age, you acquire mutations. So most mutations are acquired when you're an adult and, and beyond. Um, so another thing that I want to talk about is the evolutionary trajectory. So this is the, the path that something takes down evolution. So whether it's a straight line, whether it's kind of like, it goes kind of curved or like, you know, is it a direct process or does it kind of have multiple steps? So when I say evolutionary trajectory, that's just the path that the tumor takes as it goes from it's early state to a middle state to a late state. So from one state to another and, and another. Um, and when we kind of understand these 
these patterns and these trajectories that we see in evolution, it really helps us understand the outcome of the tumor and be able to predict it before it happens in other tumors and other patients. And ultimately that helps us treat cancer and diagnose cancer um, or like diagnose more advanced cancer at an earlier stage in other people and help us help more people. So we had talked about those early mutations and those early mutations are what we call germline. Um, and I'm not sure if this term has been brought up before, but these are the mutations that you're born with. These are the mutations that are present in the, the egg, your eggs or your sperm, depending on if you're male or female. Um, so these are the mutations that you can also pass down to your future offspring if you choose to have them. Um, then we also have somatic mutations and somatic mutations are the bread and butter of cancer. So these are mutations that are required after you're born and they're in your body cells. You're, so they're not in your reproductive cells. You can't pass these down to your um, future offspring. And these are the ones that you acquire as you get older, as you age. If you're a tobacco smoker, these are what you get um, from tobacco smoking. These are what you get from sunlight exposure and all the other exposures are just breathing. You can get somatic mutations. Um, you guys previously learned out about Mendelian genetic diseases, um, and which are like the traditional um, genetic diseases that follow a pattern of, of heritability. And those, are, those arise from these germline mutations. They're the ones that you can pass through your, your family tree. Um, most cancers come from somatic mutations. And so this, this figure here is just kind of showing like as you start out with the fertilized egg and you go all the way to like the baby, childhood, adult, um, these little, this is like a cell and then there's little shapes in the cell and those are supposed to be mutations. And as the colors darken in the mutations, they become like more cancer, directly cancer causing mutations. So you can see that you know, as you get older, you get more of these mutations and then it takes just, you know, a particular event to happen, this like red one that takes a benign tumor and kind of pushes it over into that invasive cancer um, state. Uh, Danielle has a question. Okay, yes, Daniel. He says, does this mean the older you are, the more likely you will develop or have cancer? Exactly, it does. So the older you are, the more likely you will have cancer. And cancer is in large part a disease of age. So as you get to a certain age in life, it's, kind, it's not expected that you will have cancer, but if you haven't had other things, like if you haven't already had heart disease or um, lung disease or some other like something else that's gonna make you really sick and, and probably be the reason why you pass away, you might just pass away from cancer. So there's, it's kind of like a timing thing for a lot of things. Um, so a good example is prostate cancer. So prostate cancer is um, only in males because it's the, the prostate organ and that's only, a, it's a reproductive organ that only males have. And what we found through research is that um, if they, so there was a study where they looked at, I don't know how many men, but hundreds of men who had already passed away and they looked at the um, prostate and they looked at the genetics of the prostate and they looked for cancer genes, which I'm gonna talk about. Um, they looked for cancer genes to see if they could find mutated cancer genes in these prostates of, of men that were already deceased. And in, in men that were, I think over 65 or so like that, um, over 80% of them had um, some number of cancer mutations already in their prostate. So, um, there's certain types of cancer that are more um, associated with just like the normal aging process. But yeah, overall, as you get older, it's, it's much more common. 
were there other questions or? Oh, oh, you're muted. Sorry, so. <laughs> I was <laughs> muted. Yes. So there was another question uh, from Shay and Sania. Uh, they want to know whether, uh, how come babies can get cancer at such a young age? Yeah, so those, um, I was gonna talk about that a little bit briefly. I have one figure, but we'll talk about it now. So if a, if, if a baby gets cancer or a little or a young child gets cancer, most often those are germline cancers. So those are those genetic conditions. Um, and there are a few of them. I took out most of those slides because it's kind of another talk um, to talk about the, the germline cancers. Um, but outside of the germline cancers, childhood cancers are really rare. And usually it's honestly, it's a random event because cancer is random. So we get, we, we can get mutations just like I said, just by breathing, right? So um, sometimes you have bad luck and you get that mutation in that, that one really, really, really potent cancer gene, and that's all you need. And that can cause um, childhood cancer. And the reason why we know it happens this way is because most childhood cancers are just a few specific types of cancer. Um, you're not gonna get lung cancer. We don't see lung cancer in kids, for example. Um, that's much more attributed with other things, um, but we do see like um, certain brain cancers. We do see some leukemias and some sarcomas. So I hope that kind of answers that question. Yeah. Um, and then so Jenny had asked. You the, kind of uh, answered my oh. question. Oh, okay. Because I was yeah, just asking, so, like, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just like asking like if um, leukemia would be like a germline or would it be medium or would it be somatic, but you ended up answering my question. Yeah, so it, it can be both, it depends. Yeah, so it depends on if that mutation was in the germ cells or if that mutation was acquired and it was a somatic mutation, but there are some cases where leukemia is germline, but most of the, most of the time, um, it's it's somatic, so it's just a random event in kids and adults too. Um, okay, so now we're gonna talk about the two types of cancer genes. So the first type are called tumor suppressors. And what these are, they're, they function as the break for cancer. And if you have mutations in tumor suppressor genes, um, what they do is they stop that controlled cell death that I talked about in the first slide called apoptosis. So they prevent cell death from happening. And in order to turn off the brakes, so in order to fully um, turn that tumor suppressor gene into a cancer gene, you have to mutate both of them. So you have to turn off both copies. Because remember, we have um, two copies of each gene in our bodies. And Oncogenes are the other type of cancer genes. And these are what we would call the gas for the cancer. So they promote growth. They push it towards growing uncontrollably and doing an invasive thing. And they're um, usually involved in um, cell growth and cell division processes. And for oncogenes, you usually only need one mutation because you're not trying to turn them off. You're trying to turn them on higher. So you're trying to just take one of those you just need one of the oncogenes, one of the two, and turn it into a super gene, basically. And like, it's like superpowers of growth. So these are just some um, examples. So you have here um, two chromosomes and the pink bar would be like two genes. And so if we're talking about oncogenes, just mutating one leads to accelerated cell division. So you basically are putting your foot on the gas and it just goes all the way car goes all the way to cancer. Um, and then with tumor suppressors, you start out again with the two chromosomes, with the two normal genes. You get the first mutation 
So it takes off that first break, but you have the emergency break on, but then you get another mutation and then you have no breaks. And so the car can't stop or the, the tumor can't stop growing. Um, so a couple genetics terms that we use most often and um, first term is called heterogeneous and it means that it's something that's composed of different parts. And then we have the term homogeneous, which means it's composed of the same parts or similar parts. Um, I have a picture to show you. So you have one on the left and one on the right. Can you, can you figure out which one would be heterogeneous and which one would be homogeneous? I'll give you a moment. You don't have to like announce it, but I'll give you a moment to think about it and then I'll tell you. So this one on the left would be um, homogeneous or homogeneous. And the one on the right would be heterogeneous. And the way you can see is these are all the same color. So you can say it's all the same parts. And this one, there's two different colors. So there's two different parts, so it's heterogeneous. And why does this matter? This matters because when you start to break down a tumor and its genetics and all of the different, um, all the cells that make up a tumor, they, they are different. <laughs> so if you think about with this figure that I'm showing, every little circle is a cell, but, the, but they're all together our tumor. At the beginning stage, most of the, cells in the tumor are the same type, they're the same color. It's mostly homogeneous. But again, like I told you, these somatic mutations, they just happen. But they happen in individual cells. And because they happen in individual cells, the cancer quickly becomes heterogeneous. So you get you go from cells that have the same color to quickly cells that have different colors. So now there's some green in this one. And then over here, this orange cell you know, started to divide. And now that's a bigger part of the tumor. And then we got another mutation that we have a red one. And over here, this one um, became purple and all the blue went away because um, sometimes those cells aren't as strong as other cells in the tumor. So the other tumor cells will grow more and the other, the less strong cell, the weaker cells will like kind of um, get overtaken. So this is actually tumor evolution. This is what we're looking at when we say, I wanna understand how tumors evolve. We're looking at this process. So the order of this growth can be linear or it can be branched. And I'm gonna talk about what that means. And I, I'm, I'm sorry if this is getting confusing, but there is a reason why I'm mentioning this. It's part of the activity. And I'll show you an example of it when we go over the answer to the activity. So you can kind of see why this stuff matters. So um, this growth, this evolution of the tumor, if it's linear, it means that it looks like this first path right here, where it goes from blue to green to purple. So blue, green, purple, it's all in the same line. A branched um, evolutionary pattern means that, well, it doesn't just go from this color and then go to this color and then this color, you have other colors coexisting and kind of um, branching off to create different population. So it goes from blue to blue, green, yellow, and then this red one pops up and then the red one starts growing and then you have some of the green are still there, but then there's a, another, type of green. So you have a more complex structure. And so it looks more like this. It looks more like this branch. And so when you look at evolutionary trees of animals, this is what you see. You see this branched pattern. You don't see this. And this, and the reason why is because evolution is, is complex. Things don't just go from point A to point B to point C. They go through a um, complex process. <laughs> Okay, so when someone asked about the pediatric cancers, 
um, I wanted to, I wanted to, I was going to talk about it with this figure. And this is again, a little bit of a complicated figure, but I will explain it. So what you have here is along the bottom, there's different types of cancers that are all written out. And then along this axis, you have the number of mutations that we see in those cancers when we look a lot, when we look at a lot of patients. So the numbers of patients are at the top. So when we look at anywhere from a few dozen to a few hundred tumors, how many mutations on average are we seeing? So this is sorted from cancers that have the least number of mutations on the left side over here to cancers that have the most number of mutations over here. So I annotated a couple of them. So in red, we have pediatric cancers. Pediatric cancers are on the left side of the figure and they have low mutation rates, which we talked about earlier, meaning because like a lot of mutations are associated with aging, right? So if you're mostly a pediatric cancer, you just don't have enough lifetime to have all these different mutations. Um, and then UV and smoking cancers have the highest somatic rates. So over here we have lung cancers and we have melanoma. And this again is because you have the aging component, but then you also have these environmental things that people are like putting themselves in <laughs> at a high frequency. So smokers are smoking probably, they're smoking multiple times a day. Um, usually with melanoma, you're exposing yourself to the sun all day, multiple times in your life. And then you have all the different other cancers in the middle that have some variation of somatic mutations. Um, I already explained the difference, so I kind of got to that point before we did it. Um, actually, I'm not going to go over this slide, so I'm just going to skip through it. Okay, so I think we are making good time because our break will be in about 20 minutes. So we have some time for questions and then I'm gonna go over the um, activity and I'm gonna share some data with you. I'm gonna share the link in the chat, but I wanted to give a break for questions now if anyone has them. So Daniel, you asked if there are more mutations is more the dangerous. More mutations and more dangerous. So um, the more, well, so I, I'm thinking what you're asking is if you, if you acquire more mutations, does that put you at more risk for cancer or disease? Yes. Um, however, those mutations, they have to be in those cancer genes. Um, so you can mutate genes that have nothing to do with how cells grow or whatever, and then it doesn't do anything. It doesn't cause cancer. So it's a little bit of like, yes, but, you know, it has to, it has to um, be in the right genes. Um, so Lisa asked examples of good mutations. Yeah, so there are mutations that have some um, benefit and I'm trying to think of some examples. Oh, actually, this is a good example. So um, I'm sure many of you have heard of sickle cell disease, um, sickle cell anemia, and mm -hmm. that it's, it's probably one of the most common um, genetic conditions that's used when we talk about like how genetic conditions are, her are inherited and yada, yada, yada. And it's, and it's really common in people of um, sub-Saharan and, and North African descent and also South Asian descent. Um, and the reason why is because the sickle cell gene so what happens in sickle cell anemia is there's a gene that gets um, mutated that carries oxygen in your blood. It's part of the hemoglobin protein. If you've heard of hemoglobin, hemoglobin carries oxygen in your blood. And if you have mutation in that gene, 
your hemoglobin protein, the structure gets sickled shape. So it, it gets like a shape kind of like this, like a, a smiley face kind of, the smile part of a smiley face. And what that does is it makes your cells um, elongated, that your blood cells elongated. So they don't, they get stuck in your blood vessels. And so then you can't really transport oxygen very well. Um, so you need two mutations. So you need to have both of those genes to be mutated in order to get sickle cell disease. However, if you're a carrier of sickle cell, meaning you only have one mutation, it actually has an advantage. Um, it helps you, it makes it so that um, viruses like, um, or parasites, I should say, like malaria, well, malaria is a virus. Oh, yeah. um, like malaria, they can't get into your um, blood cells because you have a little bit of that sickleness, but not enough to cause any of the sickle cell disease traits. So it um, prevents you from getting malaria. And so that's why it's common in regions where malaria is common. So I think that's the best example I have. Um, you could also say that um, being lactose, being able to consume lactose, so not being lactose intolerant, being lactose tolerant is a good mutation because actually the default, the most common thing is to, to be lactose intolerant. So it was a mutation to become able to um, eat milk as an adult. Um, and that was an advantage in communities where they raised cows. And most of that were in areas where um, it was harder to grow, uh, basically where they had cold weather in the winters because it was harder to grow things in the winter so they could rely on livestock and they eat dairy and they all that stuff, so. Wait, so is that why you said it's kind of like an evolution? Because the people mm -hmm. in like North Africa or South Asia adapted to like multiple malaria of gain getting sickle cell anemia, I'm assuming. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So basically with sickle cell, it is very much evolution because if you don't get malaria, that means that you can survive really long because in a lot of parts of the world, um, infectious diseases kill before you get cancer or heart disease or any of these other things that we talk about in, in the Western world. And um, if, yeah, if you can prevent yourself from getting malaria, you can have children. And when you have children, you pass that down. So you're passing down that sickle cell, um, the just the carrier gene, just the, the positive part of it. And then maybe, you know, you might actually still pass down sickle cell disease. But um, in the US, in um, the Black population in the US, it's something like one in 25 Black Americans are carriers of the sickle cell gene. So it's, it's actually really common. It's, it's one of the top five most common genetic conditions. There's another one called G6P, um, G6P deficiency, and it functions the same way. It's also protection against malaria. Um, it's involved in some other things though, but um, that's actually the most common genetic condition. Um, and then Carla asked, but you have to make sure that your partner is not a carrier, right? Yes. Yeah, so if you know that you have a, that you are a, a carrier or that of sickle cell um, trait or of some other genetic condition, and you know that that condition is a recessive one, so a condition where you need two copies in order to have a child with this, the disease, it is important for you and your partner, if you're choosing to have children, to do carrier testing and to, to make sure that, um, you can have healthy children. Um, but you know, there's a lot of research and development in um, gene therapies for um, some of these genetic conditions, particular sickle cell anemia. So it's, um, you know, it's becoming more promising that it's, it's okay if you have it. Um, how can people find out that sickle cell gene? They can do clinical genetic testing. And um, when we, talk later about 
um, when I tell you a bit about my path and my career, we can chat about that. I do, I work in clinical genetic testing like um, Miss Stephanie, so <laughs> we both can share about that. You can go through either of our companies. <laughs> probably <laughs> with competitors <laughs> yeah <laughs> but on the good side um yes but, yeah but usually um because you guys are all um minors if you wanted to do that you would have to get it you'd have to your parents would have to um get that for you through your doctor but usually once you're 18 um there's ways you can get it without even having to go to a physical doctor if you wanted to know. Um, okay, so I'm gonna move on really quickly to talk about this, this coding activity. And then I'm gonna share a link in the chat box with the data. So you guys can just download it or, or you can look at it. It's, it's on this website called GitHub. Um, and then we're gonna go through um, the code later because we're gonna take a break. So actually, your goal, I have too many windows open and so I can't um, go back. Oh, okay. So with the coding activity, we have an unknown tumor and we know nothing about anything, it's evolution or whatever, but it's your goal to figure out what this tumor type is and tell us something about how it's evolving or um, how it's changing. And so the end goal too, ideally would be to reconstruct the tumor's evolutionary tree. So I kind of drew one down here and it's, <laughs> I just did it with the, the lines on the slide. So it doesn't look very pretty, but you kind of want to be able to say like, okay, this goes to this and then it goes to this sample and it goes to another sample um, kind of thing. If you can get that far, it, I, that would be like, pie in the sky. I'm not saying everyone, we're all going to get there, but um, that's one goal. There's a few different questions you can ask. So I'm going to show you the, I'm going to share the data with you and I'll share my screen to show you that what the data looks like, but you're, you're going to be provided several data sets. Um, there's going to be five files, samples A, B, C, D, and E, and they're all a list of mutations. And these are all um, mutations from the same tumor from the same person, and it's the same type of cancer. They're just taken from different time points. Um, and there's a, there's a bunch of different ways we can do this, but we're, we're not going into the methods of how we would take different um, samples of a tumor from a person <laughs> while they're still living <laughs> and all that, but there are ways we do this. Um, so yeah, so it's just, different samples from different times. So we're gonna look at how that tumor is changing over time. And then you then you also have a file that has a list of genes and some information about those genes and that's called the gene annotation file. And so what it contains is the gene names, the coordinates, uh, oh, actually it doesn't contain the coordinates. I did not put those in there because I decided to make it easier on you. <laughs> um, it just contains the gene names and the cancer type and the cancer frequency that that gene is associated with. Um, your mutation file will have the genomic coordinates of the mutation. So we'll have a chromosome, a genomic position, and then we'll also have the, the base pair code, like whether it went from A to T or whatever. And then we'll also have the gene. Um, you don't have to pay too much attention into what any of this means. Just know that there's, there's a single piece of data for every mutation and it's specific. So no two, no two mutations will have the exact same pieces of data. Okay, and then um, the Python code, I was going to give it to you, but I'm not gonna give it to you right now because I want you to look at the data first. And then what we're gonna do is, um, I'll go through the code and the last part, there won't be any code. So we'll have to figure out the last part on your own, but I'll give you the code after that, after we go through it together. Um, Daniel, you have a question? I have a quick question. I'm not exactly quite sure to how to download or access Python. How would I do that? 
we're going to do it on a um, web site where everything's going to be there. You won't have to download anything. It's just, I'm going to give you a web link and the, the code will be there already. Okay. Um, and basically your goal is to answer these three questions. So what is the biggest question is what is the evolutionary order of these tumors? And can you diagram that? So can you make the tree? That's the big question. If you can get it, that'd be great. If you can't, it's okay, we'll go over it. Um, the other two questions, which should be a bit easier to get to. So what driver genes, what cancer genes, I should say, are present in this tumor? Um, Cause there's gonna be other mutations. Like we said, not every mutation is going to be in a cancer gene. And what tumor type do you think this is? So does anyone have questions about the activity before I send you the link for the data? I'm gonna stop sharing my screen. Um, Daniel, do you have another question? Jenny, yes, it will be on, we'll, we will use Jupyter, um, a Jupyter notebook to do the code so that you won't have to download anything and the code will be um, just on a website. Oh, so we're just gonna have like a link to website. We don't actually have to go mm -hmm. into the app. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So it'll be, it should be pretty straightforward. I was gonna, I was like, I'm not gonna make it too complicated because <laughs> I want you guys to get <laughs> some answer, you know, something. Um, and then the other thing too is um, with this data, if you have if you are comfortable using Google Drive, you can you can put it in a Google spreadsheet because I didn't give you a ton of mutations because also I wanted to make sure that you know you could use the code, but then you could also go through the data by hand and really understand um, you know how how we as as scientists like go through this cancer data and try to figure out what happened and how we got there. Um, Alyssa said, when I'm going to link you the data now, and then I will share the code when we come back from the break, because I'm going to walk through the code with you. So let me send you this link and let me know that you can access the data. So if everyone can just go to that link and make sure that they see there should be six files. There should be a file that says um, TCJ driver genes. That's your gene annotation file. And then there should be five files that say sample something. And you should be able to even just click on the file and it will open up in GitHub and you can look at it there. You can also download the files if you would like. Uh, have you shared it on the comments? Oh, sorry. I, oh, sorry. I was selected as a direct message to Daniel. I'm, sorry. <laughs> yeah. I'm having technical difficulties. <laughs> there we go. Sorry. Okay. okay. I'm putting it on Slack too. All right. Perfect. Quick question. Can yes. vaping also cause cancer? Can vaping also cause cancer? Yes. Um, so people think that vaping is benign, that it's it's like just air, but actually the liquid that carries the nicotine or whatever you're consuming in vape, um, when it's heated, it creates formaldehyde. And formaldehyde causes some of those DNA lesions that we talked about that tobacco smoke can also create. So we don't, we haven't seen evidence of people getting cancer from vaping um, yet. And I think it's mostly just because vaping is still new and it takes years, you know, decades usually of getting all of these exposures before you get cancer. So I think in a couple um, years, we might start to see more cases of, of vaping associated cancers. We have seen vaping associated um, lung conditions, definitely. 
Yeah, because I saw a guy get a collapsed lung from vaping. Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can get a collapsed lung. So, you know, just stay away from all of that stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Don't smoke. Don't yeah, do not smoke. Exactly. Okay, so we will regroup around 1030. Um, and we'll go over um, some code on how you can start to look at this data. And, and you guys take your break, but also like take a take a look at the data and kind of try to make some sense of what you're looking at. Try to think about it a little bit and see if you can pick anything out. All right. Um, so I'll just come back to this link at 1030. Okay. Uh, 1030, that's in about 